don't know. Good afternoon, probably uh, is the right word. Um, welcome to our first uh, uh, episode of uh, uh, guest speaker series, and I'm really, really uh, happy that uh, International Law and Human Rights Unit is. Uh, hosting a fantastic uh, uh, speaker today and uh, we uh, will have, I will introduce him in a second, um, and uh, we will have three more uh, great speakers this, uh, this semester. Next one is on the 19th of November, uh, Daniel Ritiker, from, a, a senior lawyer from the European Court of Human Rights, will uh, come and uh, talk to us. <coughs> Uh, so, if you're interested, I, I will be sending reminders over and over about that. Um, so, today uh, we have uh, uh, Professor uh, Colum Okinade from... Uh, uh, did I do it? <laughs> <laughs> <I don't know. coughs> uh, like a person with the easiest surname in the world, uh, <laughs> I can say that uh, it, it wasn't uh, too difficult. Um, uh, Colum, uh, Colum uh, is the world leading expert in the field of human rights and uh, he was uh, uh, for 10 years, I think if I'm not wrong, for 10 years was a member of uh, European Committee uh, for Social Rights of uh, the Council of Europe and uh, uh, he was a very great asset of this committee and I know that for sure, I've been told. Um, and uh, now he is uh, uh, going to uh, speak for about uh, 30, 40 minutes uh, about on, on the issue of can legal guarantees of social economic rights ever go beyond minimal standards? And then after that, I'm hoping that we will have uh, um, a discussion. And without any further ado, go on, please. Okay, um, thank you very much. I'm going to um, stand here and float across to the computer to use one or two uh, pathetically minimal uh, visual aids just to keep you distracted. Um, the, um, I'm going to speak on this topic. Um, I have to confess that this paper is um, currently sitting on my hard drive with around 25,000 words and heading for the hills, which is to say it's not a very coherent project at all. Uh, there's a coherent set of arguments lurking here in my head, which I will try and bring out to you now. But if, if, if anything is fuzzy, and it will be fuzzy, I'm just giving you advance, um, just giving you advance warning. Um, what I'm going to talk about is the issue about how to give effect to socioeconomic rights within national legal systems. I'm not going to talk about the sort of philosophical integrity of the discourse of socioeconomic rights. I'm not going to talk about how to give effect to socioeconomic rights in a political way at national or international level. Um, I'm not going to talk about critical approaches to socioeconomic rights. Okay, the focus is going to be on giving them some sort of legal expression in developed legal systems, predominantly national, though some of what I'm going to say is also relevant for systems like the EU, for example. Um, the debate around socioeconomic rights is in a very interesting place at the moment. When I began to get interested in the issue around 10, 12, 13 years ago when I started my academic career, it was a funny, the debate around socioeconomic rights was in a very strange place because you would go to Geneva and everyone in the room in Geneva would fervently believe that socioeconomic rights were as important as civil and political rights. You would hear lots of discussion about the indivisibility of rights, the 1993 Vienna Declaration, you, sponsored by the UN, all states signed up to the idea of indivisibility of rights. So you would go to meeting rooms in Geneva and everyone would talk about the indivisibility of rights. And, you would, and then you would leave Geneva and sort of enter the world beyond Geneva, which is a vast and varied place, and no one believed that. No one believed that. So there was a very abrupt disconnect, 
between the, the, the rhetoric of the indivisibility of rights as formally endorsed at UN level and as fervently believed within sections of the human rights movement in the UN and wider world views. Um, but even then, things were beginning to shift in interesting ways. Because across much of the global south, there wasn't necessarily a full agreement with the idea of indivisibility of rights, but for the new emerging post-1991, post-1989 constitutions in the global south, it was clear to many of the constitutional drafters in a state like South Africa, or to judges interpreting constitu long-established constitutional guarantees in states like India, that their constitutional systems needed to say something about socioeconomic rights. And that this not alone should be part of the sort of political constitutional discourse, but should also have some sort of tangible legal dimension. So in the global south, you have the phenomenon of newly democratizing states taking a, making a definite commitment to having socioeconomic rights being litigatable within their national legal systems. Now, this took different forms. In India, where there is no express set of enforceable socioeconomic rights in the Constitution, the Indian Supreme Court took the view from the 1980s on that the direct principles of the Indian Constitution should be taken into account in interpreting the rights that were guaranteed in the Indian constitutional framework so that the right to life became interpreted as the right to live in dignified conditions, thereby, by extension, opening up the Indian jurisprudence to a socioeconomic dimension. In other countries, like South Africa, famously, enforceable socioeconomic rights were introduced directly into the Constitution after <coughs> much expert legal debate, incidentally with the South African courts developing a reasonableness analysis. They would assess state action and see to what extent it was reasonable in light of the constitutionally mandated objective of trying to achieve greater respect for socioeconomic rights. In Brazil, you had a whole set of, of socioeconomic rights rammed straight into the constitution. Okay. Often quite precise for university, free third level ed university education, for example, shoved into the constitution made enforceable by the Brazilian courts. So you have that development in the film as well. You also had interesting developments in other contexts. In various European states, interesting things began to happen with the old constitutional principle of the social state. Now, this is a very old concept, insofar as any constitutional concept is old. Um, it was, for example, inserted into the Constitution of the Weimar Republic in 1918 by the Social Democratic drafters of the Constitution. They were concerned that your traditional liberal separation of powers orientated Constitution was saying nothing about social rights. So a chapter on socioeconomic rights was inserted into the Weimar Constitution with the aspiration of steering or directing state decision making in a more social dimension. Okay. It's never really intended to be legally enforceable, but the ambition was we'll use the Constitution to do a bit of direction, to sort of say, well, you should be concerned with the right to social welfare. Or, you know, state power needs to be exercised with reference to the right to work. Now, these social state principles used to remain quite recently, and still are in many European states, pure political declarations, political affirmations. Okay, this is what the state should be doing in an ideal state of affairs. But progressively, again from the 1990s on, you certainly see a steady pattern of these constitutional guarantees becoming more judicialized. With courts increasingly making reference to these social provisions as in adjudicating wider disputes. This has been, to some extent, by the way, accelerated since the economic crisis of 2008 and the austerity processes that followed. You can see a clear pattern in countries like Portugal, 
uh, quite a few Central European countries, Germany, as I'll discuss in a moment, of courts placing more emphasis, giving more legal weight to these highly abstract uh, declarations of social principle contained in the Constitution. You also had at international level the development of a, what has now become a highly elaborate discourse of socioeconomic rights, okay. developed by bodies such as the UN Committee on Economic and Social Rights. Um, <coughs> there we go, I was looking for some fancy, exciting picture, and I wasn't able to find one. The UN, UN websites, as many of you will know, reflect their budget, super minimalistic. Um, but you have this elaborate socio-economic rights discourse developed by the UN Expert Commission on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which interprets the, as many of you will know, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights that most countries across the world have signed up to. The UN Committee has interpreted as giving rise to certain obligations. Okay. Three sets of obligations <coughs> in particular, some of you will know, which I'll come back to. Minimum core, you need to give effect to an absolute core of rights. All states have to give effect to, for example, access to emergency health care, access to basic primary education. Secondly, an obligation of progressive realization. All states have to demonstrate they are taking reasonable steps to give effect to the socioeconomic rights. And thirdly, an obligation of non-regression. States aren't supposed to regress from the level of socioeconomic rights progress that they've acquired. We're discussing beforehand, similar to the French notion of droit acquis, acquired rights. Okay, I'm going to say rude things about that current concept in a little while. Okay? But all you need to know for the current purposes, and I'm sorry if I'm racing through stuff just to make sure that everyone's on the same page, this will be old news to some of you every now You have the development at UN level of a very, really quite detailed and sophisticated discourse of socio-economic rights. Okay. Now this is a legal discourse. Now of course it's a legal discourse in the slightly complicated uncertain world of international human rights law, where the UN expert body, its opinions aren't binding on it, but states are supposed to give due weight to its expert opinion in deciding for themselves how to interpret so it's a quasi-legal discourse, if you want to be a bit rude about it. Um, an aspirational legal discourse, if you want to be extremely rude about it. But a, 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 an attempt at international, using the language of international human rights law to develop a quite sophisticated socio-economic rights discourse. Other bodies are also involved in the project. Here's the European Commission on Social Rights that interprets the European Social Charter. There is me. Um, up there, holding forth, you will notice, um, <laughs> on a totally random shot, I'm talking. That will come as absolutely no surprise to anyone who knows me. Um, that's us sitting in Strasbourg debating diligently on whether French labour law uh, um, adheres to all the requirements of the, um, of the social charter. There's also the ILO expert bodies and others. So you've had the development of quite a sophisticated discourse of socio-economic rights within the world of international human rights law, often picked up by various international NGOs um, and parliamentarians and others. So in other words, we have an interesting situation where the completely marginal, aspirational discourse of socio-economic rights that used to exist in the 80s has suddenly become much more tangible. That the development of actually enforceable socioeconomic rights are these socioeconomic rights playing a more significant role in litigation and adjudication at national level. You've had the development of a very sophisticated discourse at international level, which feeds into parliamentary processes, civil society activity, and so on in different countries. Okay. Um, and now it's now interesting, for an area of the law that many people regard as hopelessly aspirational, vague, idealistic, it's bubbling through at quite an interesting rate. I mean, for example, um, most people, most lawyers will tell you, um, you know, socioeconomic rights 
has no status in UK law. Okay. Technically, that's not quite true, at least it won't be true until March of next year, because of course, here we have floating around in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, Chapter 4 of the EU Charter, the Solidarity Principles, which are probably principles but not rights, but nevertheless can be taken and can and should be taken by courts into, into account when interpreting and applying EU law. Okay, so you have all sorts of fairly, frankly, hardcore socio-economic rights floating around as part of the EU law, which I'll say again, courts can and should take into account as we stand at the moment in interpreting EU law or law. Okay. It's also interesting, again, to take the UK, you're having this phenomenon where socio-economic rights discourse has been taken more seriously. You see it in parliamentary procedures. Joint Commission on Human Rights gets engages with us. NGO coalitions in Northern Ireland pushing for greater progress and so on. And you're increasingly seeing quite sustained academic engagement with it. You're seeing a lot of academics very strongly coming out and making the argument that constitutional systems should engage with social economic rights. And Mark Tushnet in Harvard around five years ago wrote an interesting blog post where he said the argument is over as to whether um, states should protect social economic rights. The argument has been settled. Yes, they should. The only serious intellectual argument is how to do it. Okay. Now that was an interesting comment to me especially as some of you will know for a leading critical legal scholar. Okay, Tushnet was making the point, uh, what's driving Tushnet's comments there is this perception that, look, if we're going to be protecting human rights, it's conceptually no longer enough to simply protect core civil and political rights, fair trial, right to liberty, free speech, and so on. We also need to take into account social rights. We need to talk, take account of the way they form the individual, that they make civil and political rights real. You can't talk about freedom of speech unless you're also talking about educational formation, healthcare access, basic entitlements to them. And Tushnet's argument is that intellectually, once you open up to human rights concepts, however you do that, Effectively, there is a logic to the indivisibility argument. Once you're talking about human rights, you need to be buying the full package to be consistent. Okay. Well, many people would disagree with them, by the way. But I just want to draw your attention to the confidence of that claim. The debate is full. Okay. We, we have to be talking about socioeconomic rights, and the national legal systems need to be responding in some way to socio-economic rights. Now, Tushnet is a big skeptic, as many of you will know, about judges playing a particularly significant role in protecting rights. I'll come back to that. Okay. But Tushnet is saying his general claim is that national constitutional systems, national legal systems, national constitutional governance systems, however you choose to frame the concept, have to in some way be talking about socio-economic rights once they start talking about human rights. Okay. So, so we see this massive expansion in the salience of social economic crimes. Okay. But it coincides with deep skepticism. We still have, despite confidence of Tushnet's claim, we have great skepticism about the concept. Lots of people will still tell you social economic rights have no real meaning. Okay. But you know, they're, they're incoherent, vague concepts. Um, and even leaving aside sort of philosophical disputes about their very existence, you also have deep skepticism about their potential to be operationalized, about their potential to be given any sort of tangible effect within national constitutional governance systems, and in particular within national systems. So at the one hand, you have this massively expanded discourse coming into tension with a prevailing and uh, with a very deep-rooted set of skeptical views. Um, so that's where, we, that's where we stand at the moment. Um, and it's an interesting issue because 
the expansion of the discourse has reached the stage that the question is that it's no longer a hypothetical issue. Okay? It's all very well for someone to say, well, you know, I don't believe in social economic rights. But, you know, let me come back to the EU charter. They're actually there. Now, for the UK, of course, this won't apply come end of March. Okay. Indeed, this is one particular reason why the Charter has been ripped out of the framework of EU law that's been carried over. This is the only part, the Charter is really the only part of EU law that won't be law the day after accession. And this is, of course, precisely one of the reasons why it's been ripped out, that it contains all these free floating social economic rights concepts that many people feel shouldn't be part of the legal system. Okay. But it is. So if you're, a, if you're a lawyer in an EU state, this is part of your legal system. Okay. So you, know, the, you can have an interesting philosophical debate whether they exist or not, <laughs> but if you're a judge or a lawyer, you have to take it into account. Okay. But we are still in the situation of considerable normative uncertainty. Normative uncertainty about their value as rights, but also norms of uncertainty in the sense of, well, how great a role should they play in constitutional governance and specifically when it comes to national legal systems. Um, and you have rather interestingly different approaches developing. Okay. Some states are happy, still like to keep their legal system inoculated against any contamination for vague, aspirational, socio-economic grounds. Okay. No, it's <coughs> interesting, even in a country like the UK, you're having some interesting developments. I won't bore you with the jurisprudential detail, but if you start digging around some of the judicial review case law, you never see explicit reference to socio-economic grounds. But you do see a rather interesting phenomenon I, I described in a book chapter a few years ago as being like the character in Malaire, who was um, who, to his delight, discovered he'd been speaking in prose his whole life. Um, you know, you do have the UK courts at times engaged in a form of review that looks and smells like a form of socio-economic rights review. If you look at housing allocation litigation JRs in London, you're having some very, very interesting processes of decision-making where the the, the reasonableness of government allocation, local authority allocation decisions in areas like housing is being subject to a review that looks and smells quite like South Africa in these countries. Okay, and there's a rather interesting Supreme Court decision from around seven years ago in the context of disability benefits, which said that if disability benefits are being withdrawn in a way that's going to have a fundamental impact on someone's life, that sort of withdrawal decision should be subject to elevated procedural scrutiny. Okay. Now that's all good old-fashioned common law, administrative law development using a reasonableness approach. The interesting thing is that if you know the South African case law, it's not look that different. Okay. And you're seeing some very leading courts plunge straight into socio-economic rights litigation. The, uh, the example I give here, look at this now. This is the milestones in the history of the Bundesverfassungsgericht, the German Constitutional Court. What do we have here as one of their big milestones? <coughs> okay. and can you all read that? First and foremost, the fundamental right to a guaranteed dignity and minimum existence requires the amount of social benefits be assessed. Okay. Minimum levels of unemployment benefits, the way the Bundestag had set those benefits was deemed to have taken inadequate account of the imperative to maintain human dignity through the active and positive intervention of the state. Unemployment benefit rules were sent back to the Bundestag for it to try again. Okay. Fascinating decisions in all sorts of ways, but that's where the German Constitutional Court is at. Okay. And as you know, the German Constitutional Court has a very big influence on in jurisprudential developments as well. Now, okay, so, we're at this rather interesting place where we've got this socio-economic rights concept building up, building through, developing, well, considerable scepticism exists. There are those who would say, let's dismiss the scepticism. 
We now have a critical mass of international human rights standards. We have lots of academics saying, let's go for social economic rights protection. You are those who make very, very strongly the argument that, again, once you're engaged in the project of protecting human rights through law, then you may as well complete the constitution. You may as well have a social rights development. Okay? Those of you who know the work of Keith Ewan, and Keith here in Britain is a famous skeptic about courts being involved in the business of rights protection. If they won't do a good job and they're not democratic. Okay? Keith goes, you, you only protect civil and political rights and you don't protect labor rights and social economic rights. You have what he describes as an unbalanced constitution. So you either sign up for the full package or you're left with a defective package. So Keith confuses people because, you know, for constitutional lawyers, they need to give you much about <coughs> courts protecting reviews. And then if you're a labor lawyer, you pick up the, the the Industrial Law Journal, and you see the key saying that the judgments of my committee, European Commission of Social Rights, should be taken much more seriously by the courts. And people say to me, what's Keith saying? Keith says he lost it, as someone asked me recently. No, he's simply saying that once you engage in the Project Human Rights Review, you need to have social human rights protection. But, that does, this accumulation of momentum doesn't make all the problems go away. Um, there are still very, very good reasons why to be concerned about courts opening up social economic rights. Okay. Now, I want to draw a distinction here between the work of an expert committee like the one I was on, setting international standards through a mixed legal political discourse whose aim is to sort of influence the thinking of legislators, courts, and administrations from an external perspective, to set standards at international level. I think, you know, what we used to do in the Commission of Social Rights is a different job from how a court has to do a job of interpreting rights at domestic level. Um, and bearing that in mind, when we come to the question <coughs> about national legal systems and how they should respond to this massive development of social economic rights litigation, we need to face the fact that these rights remain the subject of intense disagreement, much more so than in civil, most civil and political rights. Okay? Um, you know, Jeremy Waldron and others like to say about how much disagreement surrounds rights. Well, you know, right, a collective bargain, the subject of massive and intense political disagreement <coughs> in the UK, for example, where at the moment the two major political parties have radically divergent positions in the manifesto, perhaps more divergent than in any other ground. So it's an area of considerable disagreement, and an area where you have rights that are quite abstract, that haven't been subject to sustained case law development for a long period of time. So you have rights whose substance is unclear. And all over the world, courts engaging with social economic rights really struggle with this issue of how to define their scope, how to give them substance. The, the developed discourse of social economic rights at international level can help, but sometimes has its own distortions. I said I would be rude about the concept of regression that the UN committee develops. Um, I have big arguments about this. I think the idea of that a regression from a human rights standard is ipso facto a violation is, is totally unsustainable for all sorts of reasons. It's a private law concept that has somehow been smuggled into various public law dimensions and now in the international human rights law. I think it's, it's non sustainable. I have huge arguments with international human rights people about this. Tell them regression is a key concept, especially in times of austerity. I think it doesn't work. Okay. We can discuss that afterwards if you want. Um, some people think that's, that I'm obviously right, other people think I'm obviously wrong. It's an interesting discussion. Um, but the point is that a lot of the international human rights language and discourse doesn't ne isn't necessarily hugely helpful at domestic level. So it's quite difficult for courts to develop a maximalist approach to socioeconomic rights adjudication, to develop the sort of approach that, say, the UN committee position have taken seriously. But I think it's unsustainable, not without courts assuming a 
ludicrously expansive role in governance of society for the non competent to discharge, and they certainly don't have the legitimacy to do so. What is more interesting, though, is whether there are more minimalist versions of rights review that can be developed. And this is where I think the debate gets very, very, very interesting. Because you, you, you see the development of slightly divergent approaches of nationalism. You the South African approach, whereby socioeconomic rights adjudication effectively becomes a form of reasonableness review, which is open to the socio-economic rights dimension. What, what I mean by that is that, you know, in the same way that reasonableness review will look here in the UK for some sort of rational coherence to a judgment that it adheres to natural law requirement, natural justice requirements, that it's not ultra vires, respects basic common law principles and so on. Um, effectively what the South African courts are doing is that they're adding socio-economic rights considerations to that review package. This isn't how they express it, that's how very much the, the jurisprudence tends to walk out. That effectively they're asking, right, your housing project, you know, that way you flattened the township and didn't provide alternative accommodation. That isn't a reasonable decision for you to take because you failed to give due weight to the constitutional mandate requirement to give serious weight to socioeconomic considerations. That's one approach. The second approach is the more minimum core approach, whereby you do what the German constitutional court did. You, you, you say, we don't mind how you adjust the socioeconomic architecture of your society. But you do need to provide a minimum floor basic protection linked to human dignity. Which they said German unemployment benefits didn't meet inappropriately. Okay. That's about setting the minimum core. Okay. There's a third approach, which is to adopt a general proportionality whereby you start assessing proportionality of government decision-making with reference to socio-economic rights considerations, like you would for civil and political rights. And let me just be very clear. I think that third approach <coughs> receives a bizarre amount of academic support, in my view, is unsustainable. It falls into it. It becomes a classically open-ended, freestanding judicial review approach that might warm the hearts of those interested in human rights, but it has serious legitimacy issues. Quite a few European courts in the post-austerity process have gone down that route. There's a fascinating judgment by the Portuguese Constitutional Court, which basically rips up the Troika austerity package imposed upon Portugal because of its failure to comply with a very extensive list of social rights contained in the Portuguese Constitution. And it does so through proportionality. Okay. Now, by the way, the democratic legitimacy issues in that particular judgment were really fascinating because the Troika were imposing a non-democratic package in Portugal. The government said, okay, we don't want to do this, but our hands are tied. The constitutional court said, well, we don't care if our hands are tied politically, this is against the constitution, so we're ripping up the package. The government very cheerfully went back to the Troika and said, we are constitutionally approved for doing this, therefore you need to pay attention to us and we negotiate. So the issues of democratic legitimacy were, shall we say, a little bit complicated in that specific which is why, um, but the, the issue remains at the end of the day that, you know, this isn't something that courts, I think, can credibly be involved in. Feel free to disagree with you. The question then becomes, what do we do with the sort of minimum, what, what then do we do with the other types of approach, the sort of more reasonable centered approach and the minimum core centered approach? I think you can construct a jurisprudence of a minimum. <coughs> define what states need to do as a matter of minimal approach. Okay, David Bilch in South Africa has made this argument, others have made this argument. I think that can be done. And the German Constitutional Court, which is a very serious court, is doing it. Okay. Um, there are a couple of problems with this. Um, first of all, 
you, you still have quite a degree of judicial intervention in complex systems of socioeconomic rights. Your, your attitude to that will depend on how fundamental you think protection of minimum core socioeconomic rights should be. Okay. Um, you also have a problem that Samuel Moyne, in these recent interesting and problematic book, The Limits of Human Rights, would say is the problem of sufficiency. Um, he effectively argues, and I'm slightly paraphrasing, um, it, it's, a, it's a really excellent book in many ways. This particular section on social economic rights is not very convincing. Um, but to paraphrase a slightly modern argument, it's effectively socioeconomic rights adjudication in the legal system will always collapse down to a principle of bare sufficiency. The courts will defer to governments, will defer to executive decision making rights, defer to expert views of what the budget requires, etc., etc., and at best will produce a sort of jurisprudence of minimum sufficiency, which still involves courts interfering in politics, but doesn't do so in a way that fully vindicates social economic rights, which has an egalitarian dimension that has to go beyond sufficiency. So in this view, it's neither one thing nor another. Okay. That leaves us, if you want, with a South African approach. Um, now, lots of people love the South African approach. There are problems with how it's implemented, which I won't bore you with. Time. We, can, we, can, we can discuss it. What I do think is possible, and whereas not every element of the South African approach can or should, in my view, be transplanted in other legal systems, what is possible, I think, is for national legal systems to recognize that there is a, that if you're going to talk about fundamental rights, or the common law rights, CCHR rights, or whatever, you also need to be aware of the social that socioeconomic rights are fundamental to the society. That if you lack adequate protection of socioeconomic rights, then you can have all the civil and rights in the world, but it won't necessarily mean that much. Okay? In that respect, I think Keats unbalanced constitution argument is force. Um, and that there is a, if you want, 